Craig Kelly, COVID and climate all dominated the first city week of the year. To discuss, let's bring in our political panel. Joining me live, a national manager of the IPA's Generation Liberty Program, Renee Gorman, and Deputy Director of the Australian Institute, Ebony Bennett. Renee and Ebony, thank you very much for your time today. Let's begin with that Craig Kelly debacle. The Prime Minister finally called him in for a dressing down after that uh, confrontation in the, in the hallway with Tanya Plibersek. Ebony, what do you believe Prime, the Prime Minister could have achieved if he'd uh, intervened earlier with Craig Kelly? Because there have been plenty of calls for some time now. Yeah, I think it's uh, more or less just undermined his leadership a lot because when this kind of thing uh, crops up, it's important to kind of nip it in the bud and get on top of it. And, of course, Craig Kelly's not the only person on the backbench or in the coalition who's got this kind of anti-science uh, agenda. You know, in the past, uh, Jared Rennick and... Uh, uh, many others on the backbench have made similar noises. And I guess if you don't do anything to uh, put a lid on those kinds of people, they are going to undermine uh, the national public health activity that we have in front of us, which is to vaccinate the entire population. And we can't afford people like Craig Kelly uh, to be out there. But the other interesting element I thought about this is, you know, the government's picking a pretty big fight at the moment with uh, Facebook and Google to try and regulate them to help public interest journalism in Australia. And, of course, Facebook is the platform where Craig Kelly puts all this misinformation out there. Uh, and we have seen uh, that the ACCC is not only concerned about the market power of Facebook and Google when it comes to journalism, but other issues such as data, privacy um, and misinformation and things like that as well. And we have seen that this kind of misinformation, the conspiracy theories... Uh, and all those other things that uh, help radicalise people on the internet, most of that happens on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, that is what the New Zealand Royal Commission after the Christchurch massacre found, that that perpetrator, that white Australian perpetrator who murdered 51 people in New Zealand, he was radicalised on Facebook and YouTube. So I think while we're all really looking at uh, the Facebook and, and Google fight uh, to regulate them that the government is in the midst of at the moment, and that's really important. I think there's actually much bigger issues that we need to be looking about uh, at for Facebook, YouTube, and these social media platforms and how they help to radicalise people online. It's a really worrying thing, trend that's cropped up uh, in the past couple of years, and because I think they are very lightly regulated, because they have so much market power, not much has really been done to make Facebook, YouTube and other social media platforms rein in this type of misinformation. We have seen it a little bit around COVID. We saw it a little bit in the wake of the siege of the US Capitol and the questioning of, uh, for example, election results on Twitter. Uh, but I think this debate has a long way to go and I hope that the government will uh, win its fight when it comes to uh, regulating Facebook and Google to help public interest journalism in Australia. But then I don't think that's the end of the debate and helping to ensure uh, that Australia's democracy remains healthy. Mm, some really interesting points there. Uh, Renee, just on the Craig Kelly issue, one of the arguments as to why Scott Morrison mightn't have done it uh, sooner is that, you know, it might have given more prominence towards uh, his particular views. What do you make of that? I don't think I can speculate on that in particular. But I think overall the Prime Minister has much bigger issues about his leadership if he thinks that one outspoken backbencher is really this much of a threat. He needs to remember that it is a Liberal tradition that members of the Liberal Party can voice their differing opinions. They are not slaves to caucus like the Labor Party are. And I think that it is good, a good thing to have different views across the Australian Parliament. I don't think that Craig Kelly is the dangerous thing here. He's not the thing that scares me. What scares me is the reaction from members of Parliament and the reactions from some members of the media who are all too eager to call for censorship for this elected Member of Parliament. As soon as a Member of Parliament in Australia is censored, that is a very, very sad day for democracy, in my view. He is there to represent the members of his constituency and to represent the diverse range of voices in Australia. And I think the response to Craig Kelly and the, like, the support that he is getting at many levels shows that he is voicing something that many Australians actually think and believe. 
Let's turn to the issue now of remote quarantine after National Cabinet. They're said to be exploring that option in Toowoomba there at WellCamp. Ebony, we've seen the federal government resist until now taking over hotel quarantine. What position would it put them in politically if they were to intervene? <laughs> A much more risky one. I think that's why they've avoided it as possibly can at the moment. Uh, obviously, the states have taken up that burden of responsibility and, you know, a, a state like Victoria really saw um, it pay a huge price there. So there is no doubt we've known for, for nearly a year now that hotel quarantine is the, the site of major risk for transmission and jumping into the Australian community. Uh, so I think it's, it's really quite something that we're a year on. Uh, we're still trying to figure out solutions to this. I don't think it is good enough. But I did note that Jane Holton uh, from the uh, COVID Commission, who also looked into the issue of hotel quarantine, uh, was, I think, raising some concerns about this idea that just moving all of hotel quarantine to be more remote isn't necessarily going to work because they need access to hospitals, it needs to be close to airports, and it also needs access to uh, a huge array of staff. So while I'm not sure if any of those concerns apply to the Toowoomba proposal, um, you know, I think there's still many issues to be worked out. And I think, you know, it's, it's really tragic that we're a year into this pandemic and we still really haven't sorted this out, knowing what a lot of the issues have been for quite some time now. And still, with tens of thousands of Australians trapped overseas, wanting to come home, who can't because we haven't been able to sort out hotel quarantine. So I think it's high time that the government took some uh, more responsibility for this and I wish them all the best. Mm, and some of these concerns raised by Jane Holton certainly have also been raised by those individual communities themselves that were being looked at. Uh, Renee, with this though, is it clear that quarantine really needs a radical overhaul? I think at this point, both state and federal governments need to be looking at any and all options to bring Australian citizens home. I have to agree with Ebony that it's absolutely a disgrace that there are thousands of Australians stranded overseas right now, unable to come home. And Australia is pretty much unique in this position around the world. And I think both levels of government are responsible for this. However, I do... Um, sympathise with a lot of the state premiers who are not seeing how this will work logistically in moving some or moving people for quarantine to remote areas seems like a good good idea but you're also going to have to remove thousands of workers to these remote areas so it is going to be a difficult task and I can also see that they would not be keen to take advice from premiers such as the Premier of Queensland who I think has had overall one of the worst responses to COVID in the country. She has sacrificed Queensland jobs, she has sacrificed the tourism industry and what's worse now the damage is done she is asking for the federal government to bail her out which seems a bit rich. Let's turn to climate now. The Nationals are reportedly pushing for agriculture to be exempt as they negotiate uh, Australia's net zero emissions target by 2050. What do you make of it all, Ebony? Well, the more exemptions that we have for uh, any kind of industry, the harder the task will be for everyone else. And really, since the Coalition Government axed the carbon price, Australia's emissions uh, have gone up on the whole. Uh, and we've been extremely ineffective at reducing our emissions and we've absolutely been slack at forming any kind of coherent national policy on it. It's a huge vacuum and it has been for many years. I think at the moment we're all talking about 2050 uh, targets and the net zero by 2050 target, but 2030 targets are just as important. And because we've wasted so much time, we really have no more to waste. So while Joe Biden uh, and his administration have pretty much done more for electric vehicles in the last week than the coalition government has managed in the last eight years of government when it comes to electric vehicles. Uh, you know, we have to be doing more. Australia is still one of the biggest exporters of fossil fuels in the world. We're still planning to build new gas pipelines to subsidise new gas plants. And if that's what we're doing, there is no transition underway. While the Australian public might be busy uh, putting solar panels on their roof like the world depends on it, because it does, our government is heading in the complete opposite direction. Now, that might have been sustainable while Trump was in office, but increasingly uh, some of our key allies in the UK, in the United States and here close to home in the Pacific 
really are putting pressure on the government to do a lot more and much more in the short term. The Pacific have already called uh, for a global moratorium on new coal mines. That's how serious they are because they are under threat right now. And every summer we see massive disasters that are an immediate consequence of how much gas and coal-fired power we burn and export in this country. They're only going to get worse. And the government just has not been serious about reducing Australia's emissions in a coherent way that brings in agriculture, that brings in industry and manufacturing, as well as the uh, energy sector and electricity sector. So it's well past time. Uh, and I think it's really important that we don't allow the nationals or anyone else to get in the way of that. We absolutely uh, have to take this more seriously and get started right now because we've already wasted too much time. And that pressure, I think, the government is going to feel quite acutely when it starts going to a lot more international fora this year where climate change is at the top of the agenda. Well, that's all we have time for this afternoon. Renee Gorman, Ebony Bennett, Ebony Bennett, thanks very much for your time this afternoon as always. Thank you. The bottom 20% uh, uh, get nothing. They're really unfair tax cuts. People want to see much stronger action from the government when it comes to climate change. It's no coincidence that we have a wages crisis in Australia. Transitioning to net zero emissions, it doesn't seem like there's much room for gas.